What if we were to change our perspective? What if we were to look at things through a different lens? What if we were to rethink church? What if church was less about appearance and more about integrity? What if church was less about the people on the inside and was more about the people outside its doors? The people who Jesus sees as valuable and loved. What if we cared less about who was wearing a hat in the sanctuary and more about the stories of those who were wearing them? What if we were to rethink church? What if instead of seeing the Bible as a textbook or a history book, we truly saw it as God's words of life? What if church was less about Sunday and more about the other six? What if after church had less to do with this, 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 or this, and had far more to do with this? And what if we took all the money we were spending on this, and this, and this, and this, and redirected it towards him, or them? What if our money was seen less as ours, and more his? Is it even our money? What if we were to rethink church? What if we talked less to people about our denomination and much, much more about our transformation? What if we talked less about stuff and more about Jesus? What if we just stopped talking so much and were quiet enough to listen to somebody instead? What if you were to rethink church? What if church was how you acted at work, at school, and this? What if church was less about institution, programs, attendance, and had far more to do with revolution? What if you were to rethink church? What if it had nothing to do with traditional versus contemporary? Or do you speak in tongues? Or do your hands reach the ceiling when you worship expressively? What if it was less about styles, preferences, logistics, and had everything to do with character, follow through? Whatever Jesus was talking about in the scriptures. It's time to rethink church. Good morning, church. Back in the first part of the century, Cumberland College of Kentucky was playing football with a rival. I think this is one of the places that actually offered me a scholarship for playing ball. Uh, that's the place they, they, take, they took dumb people back then. And um, anyway, this college here, they were playing football with this great rival. And they were totally out of their league. They were losing miserably because the opposing team was bigger, stronger, and more intimidating than they were. I, I know what that's like. You see, I played for Saudi Daisy, and we had there at the time 13 high schools in Hamilton County. And we went up to Ray County, which mainly had one school at the time, and they had these guys that looked like they ate with the cows. And the coach said, I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to intimidate them a little bit. So we took the three biggest guys that we had. This is when Andy Kelly was quarterback in Red Bank. And Greg Pankey, a big, uh, great, uh, um, great player, was running back. So we picked Greg Cheeks, which is, he was six foot four, three oh five. Sam Williams was about six five and weighed about two seventy. And we picked another guy and we said, we're gonna send them out there, and when they see how big our guys are, they will be scared, and then we'll psychologically take this game. So I'm all pumped and I'm all ready. The captain's march in the middle of the field, and here comes the Ray County Golden Eagles, and they stood a foot taller than our guys. And I went. We're going to die. And sure enough, we did. They crushed us like a can. But these guys were bigger and stronger and intimidating than this Cumberland College School. And one of their players fumbled the ball. I know what that's like, too. He yelled out to one of the teammates, get it. The teammate said, you dropped it, you get it. The young man who said that was afraid of being hurt. So he didn't want to get involved. God is looking for Christians and churches who are willing to pick up the ball where others have dropped it. That's what Crosswalk's about. He wants them to start running with it. Nobody ever won a football game by worrying about 
being tackled by the opposition. Nobody ever won a game without being scared to run the ball. That's what I did. I was a running back in high school. And nobody ever has been one to Jesus without somebody trying to do it. By worrying about whatever problems they might encounter by attempting to minister to someone. Yesterday, I passed by Linda. She's one of my colleagues and one of the agents. And I actually intended to scare her because it was Saturday and nobody's usually here. So I was going to sneak up on her and scare the snot out of her. And she had people in there. So I said, oh, hello, how you doing? And I said, I'm not going to bother you. I just want to say hi. I'm going to work on church. And the people said that she was writing an offer up for her, said, you have a church here? I said, yes. Want to see it? So I took her away and said, come on. I walked in here and the guy said, you know, I quit going to church. He said, you know why? He said, we went to a pastor and said, we're going to get married here in another month, but we want to be baptized because my wife is pregnant, and we want to be baptized before she has the baby, and, you know, we have plans to be married. And the pastor said, absolutely not. I will not baptize you at all. So they quit going to church. And there's a lot of people out there just like that. I talked to one of my best friends yesterday. And he told me this. He had some friends who were going to join the church and they lived together. And so the pastor evidently knew this as a priest and he said, you know what, I'm sorry, we cannot accept your membership. He said, I agree with that. And I said, I'm telling tell you right now, I don't. I think God's business is God's business and when we quit and start judging people, we push them away. And but this couple that was here yesterday, they quit going to church altogether. They pushed them away. Let me tell you something. More people have been drawn to the love of Jesus by our love than our judgment. And that's what churches have become is a place of judgment. God wants to see if somebody's willing to pick up the ball, to run it, and to meet people where they're at. This morning, I want to reiterate the reasons why I'm here. I'm not here for a popularity contest. Mike has asked me, you know, I'll, I'll, give me your vision. What is, your, what is the vision as a pastor? Let me share it with you for some of you that were not here from the beginning. First of all, I'm not here for a popularity contest. I'm not here to earn a paycheck. I'm not here collecting money. You will see at the end of every service, the money that we collect has been spent on the church's need. Following the service, we have a business meeting. It's going to last about five or ten minutes. And anybody interested, I'm going to show you where the finances of the church have been. We ended up within the negative as of last year. I, I am a tither. I'm not a taker. Why is that? I work 40, 50, 60 hours a week, sometimes Saturdays and Sundays, and every Sunday for the church. Why not rest on Sunday instead of doing youth service, somebody said. Because these kids are more important. I'm going to show you that in just a few minutes why I do what I do. People have been asking, Pastor, what is your vision? Let me tell you what my vision for Crosswalk is. Here it is. To see every man, woman, boy, and girl have the opportunity to experience Christ personally through a church or through Crosswalk. To develop through the teachings and example of Christ uh, how a church should love people by following the example of how he loved people. To give anyone an opportunity to be part of a loving, godly family that will never do anything but love them and exalt them. That's what the church is supposed to be about. Let God do his job and let us do ours. But we can never do his job. When we start trying to do his job and start putting out the flowers at people. I know a, a pastor, I was so mad yesterday when I was talking to my friend. He said, well, the pastor got up in the pulpit and said, we are not a user-friendly church. I'm not going to make every, I'm going to preach on this, I'm going to preach on this, and I'm going to preach on this. And I said, well, why don't he preach on how fat he is because he's about 80 pounds overweight. And then why don't he preach on gluttony? Why don't he preach on that? I was so furious. Instead of, instead of looking, he's looking at everybody else, why don't he look at himself in the mirror? Gluttony's a sin too if you want to be honest about it. That's why I don't preach on it. 
I said, tell him to lose 80 pounds and then he can start preaching to everybody else. Because one sin is no greater than the other. Amen? Amen? I don't worry about people. I let God worry about it. And if you love people for who they are, then you're sharing the love of Christ with them. They will come to know Christ. You tell them how bad they are and you're a part of a church. Why would they want to come to church? Why? My goodness. That's part of my vision, that everybody be loved and be exalted. Look for the, you know, this is one of my best friends, Rochelle, right here. I'm trying to make her mean the best I can. <laughs> People call her and they, they cuss her on the receptionist's phone and yell at her, and she gets in tears. They're like, give me the phone, I'll fix that. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. I see the good in everybody. I'm like, good, give, me, give me the phone. I'll show them good. Always, no matter what, even when people say hurtful things, I'm thinking, you're a picture of what the church should be like. You're a picture of what it should be like. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20 says this, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. My best friend said, that, said, that means that you are to go and you are to forgive them. I said, you can't forgive them for anything. That's not your job. That's God's job. There is no man that can forgive you of your sins except God. So that's not what that means. That means you go out to everybody. You teach them the followings of Christ, and you baptize them in the name of Christ, and you love them. I can't believe I'm a preacher. Probably some others can't either. <laughs> I had to apologize to a, a loan officer this week. Um, I got so upset uh, for my people because I thought one of the homes that, that we were fixing to close on that week, I was just notified that it wasn't going to happen, and then, and those of you that work with me, I get very close to people, and I care about them. And it's hard for me to separate myself. So I was so mad, I was ready to go down and talk to him. But I called him back, and I apologized to him. Because it's, it's, I have got to be above reproach. And getting mad and threatening to whip him is not going to draw him to church. But loving him and showing him the love of Christ will draw more people in than anything. You know, let me show you something. I drove down up down Mountain Creek Road just about every single day. And I see all of these apartments. I mean, there are thousands of units. CJ lives in one of them over here. And I look at them every day. And I've talked to some of those people. And I ask them why they don't go to church. And they tell me this. It's because we don't fit in. I, I, I'm not a church-going person, they say. I just want to cry, and I want to ask them, who told you these untrue things? Who told you that you don't fit in? Some of them answered, church people told me. And I can feel the Holy Spirit in my heart just stirring. Somebody told you that you are not welcome in a church? A church ought to be the place of security. It ought to be the last place that you feel condemnation. It ought to be the last place that you feel judged. It ought to be the place that, that above all exalts the name of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said what? I'll draw all men to myself. You don't have to do it. He'll do it. But we have to love people as a church. Let me just show you something else. You don't think I've studied this week. There are 340,855 people in Hamilton County. 75.8% white, 20.2% black, 4.6% 4 Hispanic, Latino, 1.8 uh, Asian, and others. Do you know what percentage that I want of these people? All of them. All of them. I don't care if they, where they come from. I don't care if they think the little fat Buddha statues are God. 
when they get in here, I'll teach them God's word. I'll love them. I'll let God convert them. Not me. Listen, I'll preach to Muslims. I don't care who they are, Buddhist, whoever they are. But when they walk in this sanctuary, I'm going to open the word of God and I'm going to introduce them to the true word. And I'm going to show them what the true word is. And I want them to experience Jesus for who he is. I want all of them. That's the way I've always been. One of the pastors I used to work for, he told a pastor where I was going. He said he'll never be happy. Never. When I went to a church, my Brother Bruce was there. He's like a dad to me. He was there when I made my, my speech when they were going to vote me in. You would think that I would get up there and say, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. Vote me into your church. Oh, I didn't do that. You can ask him. I walked up there and I said, look here. If you don't like black kids, green kids, Asian kids, Hispanic kids, or white kids, don't vote for me. Have a nice day. Because I am going after all of them. And, buddy, I did. I had Hispanics in my basketball league. I had black kids in my league. I had some green kids, too. Don't know where they come from. I had them all. They wore a shirt that says holy ball. And they knew that there was at least two men who loved them. Myself and my basketball director. They knew there were two people who loved them. There are 20, there, listen to this. There are 73,283 people under the age of 18 years old. The, the, the bad part of that is there are only like three or five youth groups in the whole city of Chattanooga have more than 200 kids. Mine had about 80. Where are they at? Who is, who is showing them the way? Who is guiding them? You know, you know the problem with some of the, the, the crime and the, and, the, and the teenage problem out here that we're having, you know whose fault it is? The church can take some of the blame for that because they pushed them away. I used to have a black kid, had an afro, and had a big old comb in his head on TV. He'd watch on TV, on, and it was publicized every Sunday night. You'd see him in there. Ricky had that comb in his hair. And he had all these kids in the front two rows. I made them sit there so the pastor could spit on them when he preached. But he was. Some people in that church didn't like it. Shame on them. 20,000 kids, 20,792 kids are under the age of five. What if we can begin to do something here and start teaching them songs Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little bitty ones that we've put a foundation in. You know, teenagers, every person that's saved, 80% of everyone who's saved are below the age of 18. Did you know that? 80%. That's why tonight we're starting the youth group back up. It's not because I want to. I love to go home and rest. I'm extremely tired. But I'm not going to do that. I prepared a service for tonight, and it's all about how, how, that God is a jealous God and how he demands our time, and he wants our time. I'm going to teach the kids how important it is to know that. There are 785 established churches in Hamilton County. That's 434 people for every single church. There's only four mega churches that go over 1,500. Where's everybody else at? They don't want any part of the church. I don't care where they go as long as they're being fed the truth. There are great churches like Dallas Bay. Habba's House has been known to be a great one. Mount Carmel and Signal Mountain is a, is a good church. I can't run with any of these guys preaching, especially Dr. Granger. But I'll tell you this. People, when they come here, they're going to feel and know the love of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sin, and the gift of eternal life. Jesus said, go and do. To go necessitates our moving. It means we got to be doing something. Moving means to change places. And to change places means we have to do something different. It may not be something you like. It may not be something I like. I told them to turn down the music just uh, this morning a little bit. They don't like it. 
They sang some hymns, hymns this morning. They're not a hymn band, but you know what? Their philosophy was, you know what? You're right. I had a meeting with them and said, we got to feed everybody. Old people like me like some of them hymns. Throw me a bone every now and then. And they said, okay. Why? Because we always have to change. The, the, the video I showed you, and we had, we, had, we had one video we were laughing at called Excuses. Well, when it's too hot, you don't go to church. When it's too cold, you don't go to church. When the temperature's just right, you go on vacation. Sometimes the preacher's too loud, so, and so we don't want to hear him. Sometimes the music's too loud, so we don't want to hear it. Sometimes it's too low. Sometimes it's contemporary, so you don't want to go. It's too traditional, so we don't want to go. All kinds of excuses. But we need to be everything to everybody. We need the church to pick up the ball and quit being afraid to minister and love God's people. We need to quit being afraid to look forward. We can't spend our time looking back because there's not much time. People are afraid to take the risk. Why, why is the church hurting today? Let me tell you why most churches are failing. I don't think I hadn't studied this. I've got a book. And I was on the internet. I look and I study and I look. And, and, I, and as I was sitting here this morning... I was praying and said, God, I, want to, I need to spend more time with you. When I go out in my office and I'm working on other things, real estate or whatever, I, I need to spend more time studying. And, Lord, that's my conviction this morning. But I was, I was studying this. Most churches are failing. It says, the numbers of congregations are going down fast. And when new people come in, what do they do? They see a church that's deep in tradition. And most people today don't want anything in their lives to evolve around tradition. Do you remember the old Oldsmobile commercial from a few years ago that it said, this is not your father's Oldsmobile. People today want reverence, not history. Most of the visitors will leave after a service and come back. You see, I brought the people in where I was at. I tricked them sometimes. I got them in. You know, when I gave the basketball awards out in front of the entire church on a Sunday morning, they want to see the kid get a trophy, you better come to church. I'm serious. And you'd be 24 teams up on the whole balcony. It was huge. Their parents would come to church. Biggest crowd of the year. There'd be six, 700 people there. That was the biggest one. Those people would come. I tell the music people, we need to amp up the music. We need to play some of the stuff they're listening to on J103 and, and other Christian stations. We need to have some hymns. We need to put our best foot forward. And pastor, preach the word. You may never get to a chance to again. They would come one time and they'd never come again. I get so disappointed. And I would pray, God, if just one family would stay, I'll do it all again. I'll go through every Friday, 12 hours, 14 hours. I'll go through every Saturday, 16-hour days. I'll go through it all again every week for four months, seven days a week, if you could reach that family. People of the day are being pushed away. They never come back. And if that isn't bad enough, today's churches are now seeing their own people start falling away. And these churches, tradition usually means more to people than vision. It's more important than the vision. It would seem to me that in many churches, memories seem to mean more than someone else's salvation. We have one guy, I know one pastor, he's been doing the same thing since the early 70s. You know what? It didn't work. It, it may have worked then, but it doesn't work now. It's not about what it means to you and the old memories the way they used to be. You got to reach out and you got to do something different. Next Sunday night, I'm having a Super Bowl party. We watched it on a high def screen right here. We all get together. I've been doing this to be the third year. All the kids come. During halftime, I'll share a very short devotion. We'll have a ball and we'll watch football. And you'll see me running around in a jersey because I'm as big as they are on the screen. And it's fun. What am I doing that for? Because it's an opportunity to minister to God's people. It's an opportunity for you to bring people in. It seems to me that church memories are more important than people's salvation. 
They get busy doing things for the church, but do not have time to even worship in church. They spend more time being more comfortable than they do praying that someone would come to know Jesus. It is vital that we understand that no football game has ever been won by an armchair quarterback. I sat there at the LSU-Alabama game, and I said, them coaches lost that game. They, they should have beat Alabama, but they, they got outcoached. They gave them a minute and a half left when they should have run down the clock. If that was me, I'd beat them. I tell my what? I'd beat him. I'd outcoached him. Instead of Nick Saban, me and the genius said he is, he outcoached him. That's why they won that game against his LSU. I know some of y'all don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Roll tide. <laughs> I guess some of you do. <laughs> Throughout the Bible, we see Jesus warned about it. Did you know that? He warned about traditions. He warned us about modeling it, but many people still just don't get it. Throughout the Bible, we see Jesus breaking the traditions for more than one cause. One of the obvious traditions he broke was the healing of the man of people on the Sabbath day. Remember when the man, his arm was, he had palsy and and Jesus said, come here. And he told the man, stretch forth your hand. And he did. And the Pharisees said, it is not lawful to heal on the Sabbath. And Jesus said, well, what man, if his donkey fell into a pit, would you leave him there all night? None. He broke tradition. It was more important to help that man than it was for tradition's sake. What about the man who, who they tore the part of the roof Jesus was preaching and they wanted to get this paraplegic. They wanted to get him down to, 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 to Jesus. They, he was paralyzed. They couldn't get in. So they tore apart the roof and they lowered him down from the bottom. And what was the first thing Jesus did? Anybody know? Did he heal him first? No, he did not. He said, sir, your sins are forgiven. If the man died paralyzed, he just went to heaven, right? But if his sins aren't forgiven, he wouldn't. And then they said, who are you that has the power to forgive sin? And I'm paraphrasing. Jesus said, I'll tell you who I am. Man, get up and walk. I got the power to do that. Do you? Get up and walk. Take your bed and go home. And the paralyzed man got up and walked, took his bed, and he walked out. What did Jesus prove that day? He broke tradition. He done something nobody had ever seen before. Nobody had ever fathomed, fathomed it could happen. He broke it, and he broke it again. Why? Because Jesus demonstrates that people are more important than our traditions. I have to change. I, I'm getting older. I, I've been doing things the same way. For, for years and years and years as a pastor, I've been in the ministry. I've been in the staff meetings. I've been with, with several pastors. I know tradition is set in with me. Uh, when I'm working with these youth, I have to be open-minded to what, what's going on with them now and how they change and what's relevant to them and how to preach to them. I have to constantly uh, 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 educate myself on how to teach the kids and the youth and the, and the congregation you know, there's an old saying, you can't teach old, dog new tr- old dogs new tricks. But in the church, you have to continue to learn. To some degree, we are all creatures of comfort. We, when we find a place we like, we stay there, even in the same pew. And I'm going to show you how that might be okay for somebody, but not okay for others. Churches need two types of people. The first person is the one who deals with the here and now or the present. And these people must make sure the way we do church today encourages others to enjoy being in the house of the Lord. The second person is the one who deals with the future, what could be, what should be. However, most churches are filled with only the first kinds of people, the type who finds the comfort zone and wants everybody to stay with them. 
We cannot do that. We can't do it. However, if we're going to serve the Lord, listen, the first church in Acts grew by thousands. Yet we find people today who say any church growth destroys the church. New people come in, oh, it messes them all up. Oh, they're going to take over. Church up in Saudi Daisy had a big split. There's a new, new church on up the road there. They couldn't get along. They split over, over who knows what. They went their own separate ways. The pastor took 180 people with him. Church, other church nearly died, but now it's doing good. Why? Because people are setting their ways. Maybe if they'd listened to him, he had had a plan. Maybe if they had at least been open-minded, things would have been different. They say if the church grows too much, then I'm just going to go somewhere else. Let me say it isn't, it isn't as necessary to connect with others as it is to connect with the Lord. And we cannot connect to the Lord unless we're doing what he tells us to do. And what does he tell us to do? He tells us we are to love people. Pastors' hearts are heavily burdened today. And I tell you, mine is heavily, heavily burdened. But we got to focus on the vision that God has given them. We have to focus on the, the vision that God has given me for this church. And God has given me an ideas and plans on how to grow. And it's not about money. We don't have any money. We were negative for the whole year last year. You know, some of the elders and myself stepped up to make sure we had some of the things we need. We'll show you after the service where all the money we collected went. We, we, we're heavily burdened because there is a vision that I want to see fulfilled. And it's not about me. It's not about ever receiving a check. It's about those people in that picture. It's about those people on Mountain Creek Road. I think about every day, all those apartments and all those people down through there. How many, where's that picture at? How many of those people could be saved if someone would just say, we care. Look at them, hundreds, thousands, thousands of them. All around, thousands of people in one section. There's probably, folks, 25,000 people in this one little section right here. I've thought about sending every single one of them a postcard and telling them there is a place different than any place you've ever been. Just come and see for yourself or watch it on YouTube. There's a family that I talked to yesterday. They're going to be here next Sunday. Why? He said, this is the kind of church I'm looking for, one that loves people first. Many congregations have limited their, their pastors to fulfilling the vision of God. And I'm going to tell you, those churches are going to die. That's why I'm sharing you with my heart today. You can ask my secretary. No one ties more than I do. I try to lead by example. I don't just talk the talk. I walk the walk. Please help me to help these people. You see, Jesus is coming back soon. And, and, and until he does, these people are lost. Nobody seems to care. And the, doors of, the days of knocking on doors don't work anymore. Because you knock on my door, I may open it up with a gun. That's the way it is. The preachers don't do that too much anymore. They don't make phone calls too much anymore. There's got to be a way to reach the people. And if I'm running, the church needs to adapt to the vision of the pastor. That's how we're going to survive. Do you know today... This week, a hundred churches will close for the very last time, never to open again. At the same time, there'll be a thousand bars apply for liquor license this week. A hundred churches closing, a thousand bars opening, and we wonder what is wrong with the church. There was a monastery in Europe that was perched on a high cliff. The only way to go to get up there was to sit in the basket and the monks would, would pull, pull you up with a rope. The ride up the steep cliff was terrifying. One tourist noticed that the rope was old and frayed. With a trembling voice, he asked the monk, who was riding with him in the basket and 
How often do they change the rope? The monk thought for a minute and he said, there's no need to change it until it breaks. This is the slogan of the church today. There's no need to change it until it's broken. Well, folks, it's broken. How should we be? Listen, our worship hurts us. Psalm 42 says, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for you, O God. I love that song, as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul reaches out to you, pants for you. Does that describe the way that we worship? In other words, when you worship, are you seeking God's face in your life? Do you yearn to be closer to God? Or at the end of the service, are we in such a hurry to get out of here and beat everybody else to the restaurant? And I mean, I've done that several times. <laughs> the church needs to change, and it starts with an attitude. Our worship must include everything that has the possibility of reaching people for Christ. We need hymns. We need wonderful messages in the lyrics. We need choruses. We need contemporary music that's reaching people today. And by the way, that last song they play, How He Loves, I'm going to tell you something. I've heard it on the radio two, two or three times. Our band blows them away. Our band is better than they are. I don't even want to hear it on the radio. I, want, I wish I had my copy of our guys because it sounds better. We got a group of talented people here. We need, to, we need to capitalize on that. We need a wide variety of music. We need a wide variety of messages. We need to be able to help everybody see God from every single side, every way. And folks, that's my prayer for me. That's what I want to do. I'm going to seek God, and I'm going to pray and say, God, what would you have me do? Which direction do you want me to go? Proverbs 29 says this, where there is no vision, people perish. The church will perish unless we have a vision to reach people. And I tell you, kids and youth matters. Like I shared with you before, everybody that's saved below, 80% of them are below the age of 18. We've got to have a high priority in our youth in order to help survive. And the more we invest in these youth, the less crime that's going to be committed by them on the, on the outside. Isn't it wonderful how children always see things with brighter eyes than we do? We can see all children and marvel at the way they view things. Yet too many times when it comes to church, we even demand that they do, that they do things the way we do things. Well, folks, that doesn't work. We got to do things differently. We try to make kids invisible so they won't bother us, so they'll leave. Dying churches are very quiet places. I'm going to tell you that now. Crying babies aren't heard. Yelling kids aren't heard. And those churches, there is no future. I left a church that had one of the biggest youth groups, or had the biggest youth group in East Ridge. Had probably one of the top 10 children's ministries in the nation. Now they have about 20 youth. That's it. They have about 20 kids. That's it. Somebody told me they only had about 12 youth the other day. They have no basketball program that had over 240 cheerleaders and basketball players. It was all about having their way. What happened to those kids? Some of them ended up in prison. That's where Ray Ray ended up. I told you that. Those kids coming to church might have had, they may have been the kids that were the ones that weren't shooting somebody down in East Lake. They might have been the kids that, that had higher grades and a higher hope for themselves because they knew that in Jesus Christ they were somebody despite what the world told them. And you see, we are determining our own future but not investing in our kids. And it's a huge difference when you raise your kids in church versus those that are not. And I know that for a fact because I've been a youth pastor 20 years, I can tell you what kids have been in church and which ones haven't. It's a difference. We make the decision, and then we make a commitment on that decision. The decision is very simple. I'm fixing to close so we can have our meeting. Do we want this church to grow enough to do whatever it takes to reach new people for Christ? Notice I said new. I'm not trying to reach people from other churches. 
if they are being fed the word of God, then I want them to be fed the word of God. I don't care where anybody goes. If every person in Chattanooga was at a church this morning hearing the authentic word of God, I'd be happy. Because it's not about me. We got to do something. We got to make a commitment. That's my heart. That commitment starts in us. It must be in Crosswalk. It must be in us. God is looking for a church who's willing to pick up the ball and run with, for, for, for his glory. God is looking for churches that are willing to step out in faith and run away from hiding in tradition. Churches that exalt his name when we worship together. Not form worship that is so conservative there is no room for even emotions in it. Is that us? We afraid to worship? We afraid to sing? Hmm. God is looking for churches to carry out his vision. His word, not my word, his word to the world. He wants us to, I added this because I was watching TV at the same time I'm ADD, I can do things like that. We can boldly go where no man has gone before. <laughs> Listen, and he wants all churches to have a high priority in their adults, their senior adults, their kids, and their youth. You know why? People matter to God. Would you stand with me this morning? The people of the church, the church today, is in bad shape. Most of them, not crosswalk. We have a vision. But most churches don't have a vision. But you know what? That vision has to be our vision. We have to say, what is, what is Trav trying to do? What is his goal? What does he want to do? I want to tell people about Jesus. I want to tell them when they're sick at home and they're crying and they feel like they have no hope and they're in despair. There is one who will never leave you or forsake you, and that's a promise. I've told kids that over and over. I said, listen, you're going to find some times in your life you think nobody cares, but I promise you there will always be one. And his name is Christ. His name is Jesus. And you don't have to call him Mr. Jesus or Mr. Christ. He's the son of God. He's your friend. Just simply call on the name of Jesus. The Bible says the demons quiver at his name. I like that. There's healing to be had. There's forgiveness to be found. Church is a family. It's not just a group of a social club. It's not a, a group of friends that have gathered together. It is a family that has come together and said, God, we are here to worship you. Just like in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember that? God said, listen, if you'll find some people other than yourself that'll worship me, I won't destroy the city. Can you find 40 of them? No. Can you find 30 of them? No. 20? 10? How about this? Why don't you find somebody other than yourself who loves me and I won't destroy the city? He couldn't do it. He was told, take you and Sarah and your kids and go back and don't turn around. And of course, Sarah turned around and turned into a pillar of salt. Don't turn back. Don't look back. I believe the reason this nation has continued to be the nation that we are. You realize every civilization, every culture after 200 years has never made it to the 250-year mark. Do some study on it. If we do, we'll be the first nation that's ever done that, that's stayed in, 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 in power throughout the world. But you know why I believe we have? It's because many of us are on our knees praying to God for forgiveness. And we're trying. We still believe we still call on the name of Christ. And we still believe in the name of Jesus. It's the name above all names. And there is no other name like it. I was telling the kids today, we were talking about heaven and hell on the way to church. We always have, always have some interesting discussions. And I said, I'm going to tell you what, kids. Every knee will bow before him and confess he is King of kings and Lord of lords. 
this morning, help me with this vision. Yes, I'm asking the help financially. Yeah, that's part of it. There's nothing I don't do either. But what what will happen to that? Postcards, advertisement, whatever we need to do to get out to this world, to get out to those people. That's where I want to go, by the way. I should share that with you since it's, it's part of your money too. I want to hit every one of those apartments one by one by one. It'll say their name because I have access to tax records because I'm a real estate agent. So I'll pull all their names. I'll print them all off on labels. I'll have or current resident in case they don't live there anymore. And they'll get a piece of mail, a little postcard that says we love you. And no matter what you think, there is a church that's different. Come visit us. Come try us. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you, Lord, for, for your loving us. God, this morning, Lord, I hope my people, Lord, your people, fill my heart, Lord, that they can see the vision, Lord, that we're not just here to gather every Sunday in a, in a REMAX building, Lord, that even hurt, our location even hurts us. Lord, it's going to take all of us to reach out to people, every one of us, to draw other people in. God, help us to have that vision, to care enough to pick up the ball and say, hey, I'd like to invite you to church. We may get cursed at. We may get yelled at. We may get ridiculed. But, Lord, inside there's a blessing because we cared enough to say something. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you forgive us all where we have failed you, Lord. Lord, if there's anyone here today, Lord, that needs a touch of your hand, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that you'll touch them this morning. Forgive us, God, where we have failed you. And God, help us to be the people you'd have us to be. And I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Would you get the lights, John? Now, you're... We're going to have a very short business meeting. If those of you that if you like to stay, you're welcome to stay. It won't take but about 10 minutes. We're going to pass out all of the, uh, the financials for you to see um, for the year. Uh, the elders are going to do that. And uh, if you're a visitor, you're still welcome to say, stay. And then uh, I'm going to have our secretary kind of go over things. And uh, People need to know, and I, and I failed to do that because I, I'm too busy doing other stuff. But I want you to see, if you want a copy, I don't care who you are, you're welcome to have a copy of it. Uh, This is actual finances. I will tell you this ahead of time, that um, last year was a tough year simply because we we had to revise. We had to have a lot of new equipment. And we're still fine-tuning that equipment. We're still working on that. We're still trying to fine-tune the music, trying to get it where it needs to be. Um, we're still working on a, a, a lot of the, those other issues. So uh, as we call the meeting uh, into order, that uh, we'll just begin. And uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, we'll, go, we'll go from there and uh, answer those questions. I, I do want to tell you that on ministry expenses online, it says, Pastor, 24000